Amen. We started a series a few weeks ago on wisdom. Can I just assure you, the greatest thing you'll ask God for is wisdom. Wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing, the Bible says. And we're going to continue on with our series today. So uh, grab your, did we already do the faith confession? Good. All right. Let me give you a definition here of wisdom. I haven't given a definition all uh, since we started this series. But uh, let, me, let me encourage you. Every day, every day, get up and say to God, Lord, I thank you. Thank you for the wisdom of God in my relationships, in my career. Lord, I need your wisdom. I thank you for it. Let's just practice it right now. Let's pray. Father, throw your hands up. Father, we thank you for the wisdom of God in this place so we can reach a great city. We can reach the hurting. We can reach the lost. Thank you, Father, for your wisdom for every business person in here, for every single person, every married person. Thank you for the wisdom of God for our marriage, the wisdom of God to raise our children, the wisdom of God for our business, for our ministry. Thank you for the wisdom of God. The Bible says, if there's anyone that lacks in wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally. He gives freely and upbraids not. In other words, he won't put you to shame. Say, thank you, Jesus, for the wisdom of God. Give God a big shout of praise. Here's what wisdom is. Wisdom is number one. Put it up there for me, please. Wisdom is seeing things from God's perspective and responding accordingly. So seeing marriage, we, we, we need to see it from God's perspective and respond accordingly. Single, being single, we need to see singleness from God's perspective and respond properly. Money, we need to see our money from God's perspective. God knows more than all of us. And when we begin to see things from his perspective and respond accordingly, we'll get God's, we'll get God's, uh, his response, we'll get his effect in every aspect of our life that we ask for the wisdom of God. How many of y'all got, y'all want God's, God's wisdom? Wisdom in your finances. Oh yeah, God's not broke. And uh, here, I put down a few other things. Wisdom is discerning the truth. Next. Wisdom is choosing the right path. Choosing, wisdom is putting things in the right order. Right? Wisdom is knowledge applied. Wisdom is, see, wisdom is not knowledge. There's a whole lot of people with a lot of knowledge and a whole lot of degrees who, degrees who have no wisdom. Wisdom is God's insight and it's, it's knowledge applied. Are you with me? Have you ever seen doctors smoking cigarettes? That's not, they got knowledge but not wisdom applied. They don't apply that knowledge. Come on, somebody. Look at Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7 through 9. This is where we started. And just review this passage real quickly just so you know how important wisdom is. Wisdom is the principal thing. It's the choice thing. It's the most important thing. It's the first thing. Therefore, get wisdom, Solomon writes. He says, and in all you're getting, get understanding. Exalt her. And she will, wisdom, promote you, and she will bring you honor when you embrace her. She will place on your head an ornament of unearned favor. Grace. She will place an ornament, a crown on your head of grace, a crown of glory. That's God's manifested presence. She will deliver to you. Amen? Now, we said that wisdom always precedes the blessing of God. Wisdom precedes every blessing of God. Don't ask for more money, ask for wisdom. Don't just ask for a spouse, ask God for the wisdom for that spouse. Everything that's good can destroy you if you don't have God's wisdom. This is why you see great entertainers die early, prematurely. This is why you see great people that you really admire their gift because they don't have the wisdom of God. That very gift that's given from God can, can, can destroy them. Are you with me? And this is the case with Solomon. Solomon asked God for wisdom and it changed his life dramatically. And wisdom will change your life dramatically. But however, we find out, found out that wisdom, and the Bible says it here, that wisdom, uh, it's, it, it speaks of, of wisdom in this metaphor as of, of a woman. And, and of course, it's speaking from the position of a man embracing this woman. Hey, can I, can I get it? You know, I love using my wife in illustrations just so I can hug her. Come on up here, Freddie. Can I use you? Let's just imagine that Sinead, 
is the wisdom. Come on, somebody. Oh, Jesus. This is grace and wisdom and favor all wrapped up in a red dress. Ow! It's fuchsia. Fuchsia, excuse me. I ain't even going to go there. This could take all day just arguing that point. I won't do it. It looks good on whatever color it is, girl. Go ahead and give me an embrace. You want to give me a kiss too, don't you? You see her hands right there? The Bible says that grace, that wisdom's hands in her right hand is long life. Show me, show me your right hand, baby. Yeah, right hand. Now, note it. Right. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Your right hand. Now watch, when I'm embracing wisdom, I don't even see the right hand or the left hand. It's just embracing me. Hold on to me, baby. See how it's holding me up? Little as she is, I'm twice her size, and, her, and she's holding me up when I embrace her. Show me your left hand, baby. In the left hand is, is riches and honor. And what the Bible is showing us is Solomon got riches and honor, but he didn't get the right hand. We found out that the right hand of wisdom is Jesus. Jesus. Will you make some noise for the prettiest woman in the world? Hold on, hold on. For the strike a pose, baby. <laughs> Amen. Make some noise for this grace of God to me. I like watching her coming in going, come on, somebody. Amen. Come on, will all the brothers make some noise who enjoy that God made woman. Aren't y'all glad? It would be such a horrible thing if, if, I, if I, well, praise the Lord. I was going to use you, Bill, but any man would just be, yeah, praise the Lord. I get to sleep next to that pretty girl every night. Some of you brothers ought to, ought to, ought to thank God for that. Let me say it again until Jarrett t- pays attention to me. <laughs> Jerry, you know you better hug God. Thank God for being sitting next to that pretty girl. That's grace and favor right there. And we don't even have to start down here in the front row with these. A little louder, please. Yes, 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 yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Let me walk on down this end. Bill, come on, make some noise, Bill. You ain't making enough noise, Bill. This is a fine woman. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Okay, I digress. I apologize. Uh, um, Now, we found out we've been using Solomon as our example because he was the wisest man that ever lived, the Bible says, and the richest man, right? But we saw through studying the scriptures over the last few weeks that he got the left hand, but he ended up losing everything. And that's what I showed you last week because he didn't get the right hand. The right hand is the most important thing of wisdom. The right hand is a revelation of Jesus. Solomon initially had it under the old covenant. It shows us a picture of that. And it's in and Chronicles. Put my verse up there for me. First Chronicles, excuse me, First Kings chapter 3 and verse 15. It says when, this is when Solomon asked God for wisdom. He awoke. Remember, he went to Gibeon. In Gibeon, this is significant because there's all kinds of types and shadows hidden in the scriptures. But in Gibeon, uh, he went there to ask to to ask God for wisdom and worship he made a thousand sacrifices Solomon did and he fell asleep but at Gibeon while this is significant because the everything that was in the tabernacle of Moses was at the high place in Gibeon except for one thing the one thing that wasn't in the tabernacle where he went was the ark of the covenant the ark of the covenant is a picture of Jesus. So he had a good heart. He meant well, but he didn't have Jesus. He, now, what I mean by that is he didn't have genuine relationship. See, there's many born again believers who have gotten born again, but don't have relationship with Jesus. And that's what I'm talking about. The right hand is having genuine relationship with Jesus. I have a relationship with my wife every day. A day will not go by that I don't talk to her. Now, not every day. Sometimes I'm out of town or some days we're, we're really busy and we don't get to have very intimate conversations. But every day we talk. This is how your relationship with Jesus should be. 
Every day you're talking to him about whatever's on your heart. You're talking to him about your dream. You're talking to him about your children. You're talking to him about everything. And the more you have a, a realization of his presence with you, the more you'll understand why this is the most important thing. And that's what we talked about really over the last couple of weeks. If you weren't here, please, please, it's the most important thing. You've got to get those CDs. This is all going to come out on the series, but you can see last Sunday's message if you go home today and probably tomorrow is still on the internet. Solomon, after he asked God for wisdom, he woke up in the dream and then, well, here, let's just read the passage. And it, he came back to Jerusalem and stood where? before the Ark of the Covenant. The first sign of wisdom is a revelation of who Jesus is. Are y'all with me? The first sign of the wisdom of God is you getting genuine relationship with Jesus and knowing who he is. It's the most important thing you'll ever do in your life. If you'll read through the Old Testament, you'll see that all the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the thing that they had and the thing that God kept repeating to them was this, I'm with you. That's it. He would say, I'm with you. Well, think about it. That's all they would have is just that revelation. But we many times don't have that revelation that he's with you. It doesn't matter how bad your situation gets. If you've got a revelation that Jesus is with you, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. That right there will make it a much, much easier. Then you'll have this wisdom and understand through every difficulty that I go through, there's wisdom in it. God is not intending on me dying in this situation. He's not intending on me being taken out. He's showing me some wisdom. And so this is what Joseph understood. Joseph, Abraham, Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. You remember Joseph? Joseph ended up in prison. He was betrayed by his own brothers. But you'll never find him complaining in the scriptures. Why? He had a revelation. God was with him. And you can read it all through Genesis. God was with him. And while he was in chains and fetters, Joseph was sold into slavery. He had chains on him. And the, and the Bible reads, it says this, Joseph was a slave, but the Lord was with him and he was a prosperous man. While he was in chains, naked, just a loincloth on him, the Bible says, but he was a prosperous man. Why? Because God was with him. See, if God's with you and you know what that means, there's nothing that can hold you down. When you know that Jesus is with you, if the doctor gives you a negative report about cancer or some sickness, you go, no problem. He died for my, for my healing. Whatever you're facing today, if you get a revelation of who Jesus really is, that problem that you're facing is really not a problem. And in fact, the truth of the matter is, if your problem seems too big to you, it's simply because Jesus isn't big enough yet. Push the person next to you and say, but you're in the right place. Because <laughs> that's all we talk about here is Jesus. He is our righteousness. He is our sanctification. He is our holiness. He is our deliverer. He is our healing. He is our prosperity. Jesus is everything. <laughs> and the world needs to know that. And he's not mad at you. Push the person next to you and say, God ain't mad at you. He's madly in love with you. All right, stop messing with me. I'm trying to get off my first note here. Go to the next verse. Go to the next verse. Here's where we find the sign of the second, the second sign of the wisdom of God. All right? First sign is what? Good God, I went through all that and y'all said... Somebody in the front row. Thank you. Revelation of Jesus all together. The first sign of receiving the wisdom of God is a... Even if you didn't hear me, just read the board up, up there. Try one more time. The first sign of receiving the wisdom of God is? All right. Say, I need a revelation of Jesus. I've got to see him clearer and clearer. That's why you come to this church, all right? Now, watch this, y'all. This is how awesome the Bible is. Chose us the, the wealthiest, wisest men in the world, and then shows us every fine detail of what happened to him after he received the wisdom of God. So it's showing us what we receive. 
All right, and there's a story. I'll just read this first verse to you, then I'll tell you the story. Now, two women, after he received the wisdom of God, he went back to and sacrificed over in Jerusalem. That's Jesus. He recognized who Jesus was. It was there with him all the time, right? Now, two women who were harlots came to the king and stood before him. Now, let me tell you the, the story that happens. You can see it all in these next passages. What happened was these two women came to the king and they said uh, they both had babies and they were living in the same house. And in the night, uh, one of the women turned over and slept on her baby and suffocated the baby and the baby died. While the other woman was asleep, she went over, traded her dead baby, newborn baby, traded that baby out with this other woman's baby right? Traded the baby out. And then in the morning when the mother who was still sleeping woke up, she saw that her baby was dead, but it wasn't really her baby. It was the other woman's baby. You get the picture? So she's fussing at her going, hey, hey, you took my baby. That's my baby. Come on. How many of you mothers are not going to mistake your baby? But this lets you know the character of the woman because the woman was like, I ain't giving him up. Come on. Come on. Can y'all get the picture of this? This woman, like, uh-uh, this is my baby. And I'm the, this is my baby. And she's like, no, 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 that's my baby. You start, this is not my baby. I've been nursing my baby. I know my baby, this ain't my baby. And they were having it out. And then the Bible shows that they went to King Solomon. And they went to King Solomon. And King Solomon resolved the whole issue. Do y'all know how he did it? He did it by getting, he said, he heard both of the stories. And he, he, well, you can read it all in the past. He heard both of the stories. And then he goes, here's what we need to do. He says, go, somebody go get me a sword. He said, go get me a sword. Hold the baby right there. Y'all put, put the baby right between them right there. He says, okay, I'm going to cut the baby in half and we'll give one half to you, baby. We're going to give the other half to you. And so he took the sword and he got ready to lift it up. And the, and the one lady says, no, 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 please don't kill him. Just let her have him. Solomon says, the baby is hers, the one who spoke up and gave the baby. Now, do you all get the significance of that story? Now, the third key is in the rest of that story. But the first key is this. How many of you know that the king doesn't normally sit with people that are harlots. The second sign of wisdom is a heart for the lost and the hurting. Two prostitutes can't walk into President Obama's office. Two harlots can't normally walk into the wisest, wealthiest king of Israel's office either, but he allowed them. How did they get to that high? How? How would two prostitutes who were living in the same prostitute house walk before the king? How could they do that? Because the king had a heart for the hurting. The king was willing to listen to two prostitutes when most people are unwilling. Think about it just for a second. These are the kind of people that most people would have said, who cares? Just work it out. Most people would have turned their back on him because they weren't paying great money. They didn't have great substance. But wisdom was this king who is the wealthiest, wisest man in the world had a heart to hear. He had a heart to hear the hurting. Come on, somebody. Push the person next to you. What happens when you get a revelation of Jesus, the first sign of wisdom, is you'll get a heart for people. You'll get a heart for hurting people. Are y'all listening to me? Why was Solomon the wealthiest in the world? He had a heart for the hurting. Come on, somebody. Y'all, see, we've tried to go get the money when God is saying, no, 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 get me, then you'll get my heart, then I can give you the money. But if I give you the money with you, without you having a revelation of me, first of all, you'll think it was you. Secondly, you'll just be spending it more and more on you. Thirdly, you'll end up with nothing. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Come on, somebody. He had a heart. Now, turn on over in your Bible to Matthew chapter, excuse me, Luke chapter 15. This is where I'm trying to go. Luke chapter 15, and this is, I touched on some of this. This is the heart of Jesus. And I'm, I'm not going to be long. I'm not going to read all these passages. We'll just tell you about it. Let's, I'll read the first three verses here, and then I'll tell you the story, and then we'll go home and get some chicken. Y'all ready? Everybody happy? Are y'all getting what I'm saying here? 
By this time, I'm in Luke chapter 15 and verse 1. By this time, a lot of men and women of doubtful reputation were hanging around Jesus, listening intently. That's the Message Bible version I'm reading you. In the, in the New Living Translation, it says, uh, it says, tax collectors and notorious sinners were hanging around. Oh, there it is. The Pharisees, oh, what version? Okay, hit verse 2. Hold on, I want to make this point. Jesus hung out with tax collectors and notorious sinners. Notorious sinners are people who are known for stealing, known for lying, known for killing, known for pimping, known for stealing. The tax collectors were notorious sinners. They were hated, and we talked about this. Jesus had a thief, and who was Judas, and he had a tax collector on his staff. He knew that he had a thief and a conniving tax collector on his staff, and Jesus hung out with these people. Watch what it says. The Pharisees and the religion and the religion scholars were not pleased that, that all these sinners, notorious sinners, these notably bad people were kicking it with Jesus all the time. They didn't like it. They had a real problem with that. And they were not pleased, not at all pleased. They growled. Who growled? The religious people. They were growling, oh, God, I can't believe he's hanging out with them. He takes in sinners and eats meals with them, treating them like old friends. Next verse. Watch this. Come on, y'all. Their grumbling triggered this story. And now Jesus began to tell three parables. Now, let me set it up for you. And then we'll t I'll tell you about the three parables. And then we'll go get some chicken. Watch this. These people that Jesus was hanging out with were bad people, according to most standards. In fact, Jesus did. Jesus hung out with people that were hurt. Jesus hung out with people that had diseases. He hung out with people that had, uh, you know, that were lepers, that were quarantined. He hung out with people that were really hurting. He hung out with single moms. He hung out with people that had been hurt by bad people. But Jesus also hung out with the people that had hurt the good people. So the scribes and the Pharisees, you know, really when we think about it, they were not bad people. They were guys who were looking and saying, hold on here. You know, that dude who, you know, Zacchaeus that Jesus is kicking it with, he stole my grandmother's retirement. I mean, she was getting ready to retire. Her granddad is dead now, and, and he took all her money. She's homeless now. She can't retire. She's working over at McDonald's now because Zacchaeus, sitting there with two women on his arm, sitting there with his Rolex watch on, he took my grandmama's money. And Jesus is kicking it with him. My best friend, she's a single mom. And, and I mean, she, her, her husband ain't pay, her ex husband ain't paying no child support. Her baby daddy ain't doing nothing for him. And Jesus is kicking it with him. So these people that Jesus was hanging out with, I mean, they were bad people. And I would venture to say that even many of us right here in destiny, in this grace church, might have sided with the Pharisees. These are the people that did you and me and our parents wrong, our grandparents wrong. Are y'all listening to me? And Jesus is hanging out with him. So the Pharisees and scribes are mad at this. They're grumbling and they're complaining. And so Jesus, now this is what I love about Jesus. Jesus, who is the God of heaven and earth, here and earth, could have broke it down in some heavy terms. I mean, he could have spoken so bombastically that no one would have understood what he said. But you know what Jesus does is he says, come here, y'all. Let me tell y'all a story. Here's why I hang out with these people. And he tells three stories, three parables in this chapter, Luke chapter 15. First story is about a shepherd who loses his sheep. He has 99, he has 100 sheep and one gets lost. And Jesus tells the story, he says there was a shepherd, he had 99, he had 100 sheep, but one gets lost and this shepherd is so awesome that he risked the 99, leaves the 99 and goes looking in the wilderness, leaves the 99 in the wilderness where there's lion, tigers and bears, oh my. 
and goes looking for the one. He's willing to risk the 99 to go find this one lost sheep. This reminds me of a story when I was a little boy and uh, we lived in Columbus, Ohio. Columbus, Ohio has the largest state fair in the world. And, and my family would go there when we were little boys, me, my dad, and my br brother, and my mom. We would go there, and one day, I mean, it's, it's hundreds of thousands of people. And we stayed there, and one time we went to see the Jackson 5. Stop! No, no, no! We were there. I was there to see Michael Jackson and the Jackson 5. Back in 1973, come on somebody. Well, we were there one year, and my little brother, who is now runs the audio and television and all that stuff here, my little brother knows no strangers. And my brother would always somehow, wherever we are, get separated from the family. Y'all know the little child that just goes up and just starts talking to everybody? That's my brother. <laughs> And so my little brother, he's maybe at the time, maybe five or six years old, a little boy, four, five, six years old, and he separates from us at the Ohio State Fair. We've lost him, and it's getting to closing time, and we're standing there by the gate waiting and looking, trying to find my brother. We've reported it, and come on, but it's hundreds of thousands of people at the fair, and here we are. I mean, it's a terrifying moment. It's a terrifying moment. My mom is there with tears and we're all wondering and, and you know, we're all looking around and I'm holding on to my mom's hand. I remember it like it was yesterday. And all of a sudden, it's closing time at the fair. Thousands of people going this way and we're standing there, standing there at the, near the gates looking, looking for Marty. And then here comes this person holding Marty's hand. <laughs> Marty's like, there they are! And of course, my mom embraces him. You know how women are. Mom comes, oh, she's kissing all on him, hugging all on him. But then she puts him down and my dad comes over to him and says, listen. <laughs> like any dad normally would, you know. Son, we told you, stay with us. We're, you know, and he's kind of reprimanding him a little bit, you know. Don't get separated from us. Please stay with us and all this sort of thing. Then he's kissing him and hugging him. But do you know this what Jesus does? He's describing why he hangs out with the people that he hangs out with. He says, it's like this. It's like a shepherd who has a hundred sheep, but one gets lost. Now, let me just tell you, this ain't like a normal shepherd because a normal shepherd, if he has 99, he's not a hundred. He's not willing to risk 99 for one. He really, he'd say, well, go ahead. That's what one's lost. I still got the 99. But this shepherd goes, no, that one is more valuable to me than all of these collectively. I need that sheep. I don't want him lost. So he goes over and watch what he does. He finds the sheep. He takes the sheep. Does he beat it? Does he put a collar on it? No. He grabs the baby sheep, puts it on his shoulders. The Bible is saying this to us. He's saying, no, no, God is so concerned about one little missing one. He doesn't reprimand him. He goes and puts it on his strength and carries it back. Then he comes back rejoicing, calls all his friends and says, let's throw a party. I've just found that one lost sheep. The Bible says heaven rejoices over one sinner that finds home more than the 99 that are already righteous. What it's showing us is God's heart towards the lost. Yeah. The next story, the next story talks about a woman who's lost. She has 10 silver coins and she loses one silver coin. Now what this is, all of this is not just about sheep, uh, real sheep and real coins. It's all typology. Yeah, yeah. All right. We know that the shepherd and the, and the sheep is talking about Jesus and the people. Right? The coin and the woman, always a woman in the Bible represents uh, uh, people, right? Or the, the age of the Holy Spirit. The woman represents the Holy Spirit age uh, and the, of the church, right? And the 10 coins, 10 silver coins represents money for redemption. Silver represents redemption. She loses one tenth. One coin is talking about the church loses the tithe. They lose the purpose of tithing. Yeah. The purpose of tithing is for redemption of the lost. But the Bible says she digs through the house and turns the house essentially upside down to find that one last coin. And that it says she uses a lamp. She lights a lamp. That means revelation has to be restored for what, for what the tithe is about. And when she finds it, she rejoices, calls all her friends. Now just think about this logically. If you've got $10... 
and you just lose one. Are you going to rip your house apart looking for the one? No, let me put it in real terms. Let's say I've got 10 Krispy Kreme donuts. <laughs> and Bill comes and eats one of my Krispy Kremes. <laughs> I'm not going to fight with Bill. I'm going to go, I got nine left, Bill. <laughs> and I'm going to be all right. But God didn't like that. God's like, uh-uh, I got to get my other Krispy Kreme. <laughs> no, it's redemption in coins. So he's going and looking for that. Are y'all listening to me? Then the final, the third story is a, a really, it's, it, we think it's about a son, but it's really about the father. The whole story is about the father and two sons. One son, the younger son, I'm closing, the younger son says, hey, dad, looky here. Uh, I'm ready for all my inheritance now. I'm ready for my college fund now. I just want it all in cash right now. And the father says, son, are you, are you sure? You, want, you, wanna, you heard what I said, dad. I wasn't stuttering. I want my money now. This was not a good son. This is, a, this is like saying to dad, I'm not willing to wait for you to die. Give me my money now. It's kind of like you're dead to me anyway, so you might as well just pay me my money now. When Jesus is telling this story, all the other Jews and the, the scribes and the Pharisees and all the people around listening are hating this boy because this is breaking the law. You have a disrespectful son like this, you're supposed to stone that boy, right? But what, is this, what happens to this boy? The father ends up giving the son his inheritance. He gives him his inheritance now, and the Bible says that that boy takes his inheritance, goes to a foreign country, foreign land, and blows all of his money on prodigal living. This dude went to Vegas. He went to Vegas. He got him a few strippers. He got him a, some escort service. He got him some cocaine. He got him some weed. Come on, somebody. And he got him, he got him some alcohol. He got, he started throwing a party. His dad was rich and he blew all the money. He thought he was going to be a rapper. So he started him a little rap company. You know how a young fellas want to start a, be a rapper. He was, and so he went out there and he blew all of the money. He blew all the money on, on a girl's name Candy. If your name is Candy, not you, some other girl named Candy. He went out there and he blew all his money, right? And so he, while he's out there, he has to get this job working for, for, a, for a, a person who has pigs. And so he's working. Now, from a rich son, now he's working in the pigsty. And the Bible says that he got so hungry and nobody was helping him that he desired to eat what the pigs were eating. Now, y'all, this is bad when a Jewish kid... Come on, y'all know how, Jews, uh, how Hebrews feel about uh, how, uh, pork and pigs and stuff, right? Porky the pig is not his favorite cartoon. But now he wants to eat what the pigs are eating. Now, now understand, pigs, uh, pigs eat where they... Come on, y'all, do I need to spell it out? They stand in that same stuff and eat all of it. They eat anything. You, you lay there long enough, they'll eat you. They have a baby, the baby's laying still, they'll eat the baby. That's why they say don't eat no pork chops and all that stuff. Bacon. <laughs> so anyway, this dude, this dude, watch, watch, watch. This dude, he's, he, he realized he's broke, busted, and disgusted. And what, all, all of it is a picture of somebody who's left the house of God. Doesn't understand the love that their father really has for him. Ends up broke, busted, disgusted with nothing. Ended up working for somebody in the world. It's showing how a believer is if he doesn't understand the father's love for him. And he gets out there. And so he comes to, the Bible says, when he came to himself. Are there any believers in here like me who, in one time or another in life, and even recently, come to yourself and go, oh, Lord Jesus. Come on, hit the person next to you and say, put your hand up. Come on, if you ain't been there, you gonna get there. Well, you come out, come on. You, you thought grace meant at first that you could just now go back out to the club and start drinking beer and hanging out with your friends again. No, no, no. What grace is for is so that you can begin to share to others how much God loves them and not put them under condemnation. Get the person to high five next to you and say, I knew that's what it was really for. I didn't think it was just for getting drunk again. Come on, somebody. Oh, uh, there's a little murmuring in the, in the group right now. Hold on. Is that what it's really for? Did yeah. the pastor say that? Did he, did he come over to the house or something? What's going on? 
No, 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 no. No, we just got to get our perspective right. So he says, look, I need to go back to my father's house. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, when I go back to my father's house, now I'm no longer worthy to be his son. I'm just going to come in and ask him if I can be a hired servant. Now, this son thinks that what he's done has disqualified him from being a son any longer. He no longer sees his worth to the father. He thinks he's not worthy. And this is where the word worship comes from. When you know, when you know that God is the one who's given you righteous. Jesusness, Jesus is the one who's given you righteousness. It's not your righteousness, it's his righteousness. I thought I'd get a little better of a response than that. It's him. Jesus is everything, y'all. So the son, watch this. He comes back. We don't, have a, uh, we don't know how long he's been out. But anyway, he decides to come back. He starts coming back. And the Bible shows us that when he's a far way off, the Bible says why he's a far way off, that the father sees him a far way off, a distant way off, and starts running towards him. The father. This is the first time that we ever see in the scriptures that the father is doing anything else other than sitting. What is he doing? He's running towards a son that's been lost. He's running towards a sheep, a child of his. In fact, now, now watch this. You say, but pastor, I thought this was about, a, about uh, sons. And all. No, Jesus doesn't consider sinners sinners. He considers them sheep without a shepherd. The Bible says that Jesus describes sinners as sheep without a shepherd. See, God views the loss different than we do. The church doesn't like the loss. God so loved the world that he died for the loss. God loves drug addicts. And then this is the question I want to ask you. How many pimps? How many prostitutes? How many drug dealers? How many thieves? How many notorious sinners are in your iPhone? These are the people that Jesus hung out with. Why? Because I want to win them. I love them. My father's nature is he's willing to go after those ones that are lost. He loves them so much that he's willing to risk the safety of these righteous ones because they're already right. To go after one lost one. And the repeated thing through all three of those parables is how much heaven rejoices. How much the father rejoices. How much the Holy Spirit rejoices. How much the shepherd rejoices over just one that's found. Friend, I want you to know that each one of us are here on earth for this reason. That's right. That's why we're here. Not just to get more and more for us and focus on us. Here's the deal, how God set it up. The more you focus on them, the more I'll bless you. But the moment we become introspective and just look at us, our four and no more, and don't care about hungry children, don't care about the loss, the more we'll just be on our way to heaven with our selfish butt. There's this passage in Luke chapter 14. I wish y'all would turn to this passage. I'm closing with this, and I know I didn't put it in my notes. Turn it into it in your Bible. Turn to it in your Bible. I love this. This is some of my favorite passages. It's in, it's in Luke chapter 14, verse 16, and I'm closing right here. Luke chapter 14. My help can come on up. Luke chapter 14. Do y'all hear me today? Do y'all hear your pastor today? Why prosperity hasn't worked is because we sought the left hand. We went after prosperity when God was saying, no, 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 go after me. Are y'all with me? Watch this. It's in Luke chapter uh, 14 and verse 16. It says, then he said to him, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many and sent his servant at supper, to, uh, to supper time to say to those who were invited, come for all things are now ready. What God is telling us is everything is ready for my people now. Everything is ready for him. Healing is ready for him. Blessing, forgiveness is ready for him. But with, they all, with one accord, began to make excuses. The first said to him, I, I bought a piece of ground and I must go to see it. Their business was more important than Jesus. He said, I ask that you excuse me. And another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I, I'm going to test them. I ask you to excuse me. Another one said, well, no, you know, I've got these, I've got these cars. I've got this business. I've got this and it's, I'm too busy to come. And then still another said, well, I just married a wife, and I, therefore I can't come either. 
So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, began, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets, the lanes of the city, and bring in here the poor, the maimed, those who are missing limbs, those who are missing parents, those who've had children robbed from them, those who've, had, who've been deprived and stepped on, those who didn't get educated, those who got addicted to drugs because some drug, drug dealer was slick, those who got on prostitution because they couldn't, take, couldn't pay, bring food home to their baby. They, ha- they saw no other way out but to sell their body. He said, go out and get those that are hurting. They want me. When they know how good I am and how, how much I love them and how I'm not mad at them, they'll want me. He said, go bring them in. Friend, this message today is about us reaching the lost. And I want every one of us in here to pray that God gives us a heart. God gives us a heart for those who have hurt us, for those who have done us wrong, for those who have done others wrong, for those who are being overlooked, for those who are behind bars, for those who are on drugs. When we drive by those who are homeless, when we drive by them and, oh, don't look, don't look, don't look. In my afternoon service this week, I asked, and, and, and in the congregation at the after, in the evening service, I said, how many of you have been homeless? And many raised their hand. We had a testimony for, from a young lady here uh, on Wednesday who's right here in this congregation who got caught up with the, with the wrong boyfriend, ended up going to prison. He was selling dope. She wasn't really aware of what went on and they came and feds were out watching him and she told her whole testimony. It was an awesome time. But my whole point was this, not to put her on blast or put her on the spot she saved, but just to let you know that they're people just like us. In fact, it could be us. Could have been us. And I want everybody in this place to bow your head. First of all, I want to talk to those of you who don't know Jesus. I want you to know this, that God is in love with you. And that you're not here by accident, that he has great things in store for you, your family. God wants to provide every single thing you need and the dream that he's placed in your heart. He wants to bring that to pass. But he wants something from you too. God doesn't want you to keep a secret about who he is. He wants you to go tell somebody. I want to challenge everybody in this church. Let me get back to this. Let me challenge everybody in this place. This week, I want to challenge you to tell somebody at work put your radar up at work at school wherever you are and just begin to tell somebody look for somebody hurting somebody perhaps whose husband has left them somebody whose child has gone astray somebody who's addicted to drugs somebody who's in trouble somebody who's hurting and I challenge you to go tell them just ask the Lord to help you go tell them Friend, God's not mad at you. He's in love with you. He died for you. And whatever it is you're going through, God has your resolve. And this that you're going through is not the end, my friend. I'm telling you, it's not the end. Your life is going to get much better through Jesus. I want every one of you to look for somebody this week. See, see somebody. And they're right there in your surroundings. God has strategic you, strategically placed you right in the midst of some hurting people. And the, the deliverance that you need is right there in the mouth of the fish, you. You open your mouth and begin to tell them, God's going to deliver you. Just prophesy to them just like that. God's going to deliver you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around.